like this one. Throughout the semester, we bring specialists to campus to go more in depth about certain areas that we want to talk about. The Vegetarian Society also shows documentaries like our upcoming showing of Vegucated on Friday, December 7th, as, as well as hosting structured discussions with other groups on campus like the Philo Feast on November 15th with the Undergraduate Philosophy Association. We try and support as many activist groups on campus as well by attending other events, like the showing of the Koch Brothers Exposed documentary by the, uh, Democracy Matters on November 4th, which many of our members will be attending. You can find us rain or shine out leafleting around campus at least once a month or more likely every day. Also, we try and leaflet throughout the city of Boston on a regular basis and spread the veg news as much as we can. We also work back to give to the. We also work to give back to the community um, through volunteering efforts throughout the city of Boston, like our trip to um, Maple Farm Sanctuary, which will be happening happening on November nineteenth, um, and we're going to bring a huge group out there and do some good volunteer work. Our group strives to innovate our activism efforts all the time and spread our message even further through our own members' input. We meet every other week from 6.30 to 8 in CAS 442, which is the Environmental Lounge, and we discuss relevant, relevant issues in the animal rights movement, as well as brainstorm and plan new events that um, we want to host here on campus. So I look forward to seeing you there in these upcoming weeks, and now to introduce our speaker. Avery Harper is a PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis, in Critical Geographies of Food and Race. Her dissertation, which is scheduled to be completed at the end of this year, focuses on how particular racial concepts operate within vegan food politics. Harper focuses on this intersection by analyzing key works within the movement, including Queen of Food's um, Sacred Women, Food Empowerment Projects, Food Empowerment Brochure, and PETA's Cruelty-Free Vegan Shopping Guide. Harper believes PETA, Food Empowerment Project, and Sacred Women represents major organizations and critical works within the landscape of vegan food philosophies that aim to produce cruelty-free and ethical spaces across multiple, across multiple scales, including consciousness, the body, the home, the community, and the globe. Harper believes that these three sources represent different types of relationships with vegan commodities as a method for achieving ethical consumption and ultimately a more socially just planet. Harper brings these ideas together in her well-known anthology, Sista Vegan, Black Female Vegans Speak on Food, Identity, Health, and Society, and her involvement in the long-running blog by the same title. Breeze works avidly to deconstruct neoliberal whiteness and consumer capitalism as it undermines the vegan com commodity culture by speaking out on many of these issues. Harper is also expected to release a new novel, Scars, in February 2013. It's published through the Black Coffee Press, and Scars focuses on the struggles of a black lesbian teenager in our own backyard of rural white New England. Harper will also be publishing a sibling project to Sister Vegan called Brother Vegan in early 2014, which will examine the, what society, health, food, politics, and social justice looks like through the collective North American black male vegan consciousness. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Avery Harper. everybody hear me well enough? Great. So thank you for inviting me to fly out here. Um, for the first time in about four years I've flown somewhere without my baby so some people expected me to bring the one and three year old with me like I usually do often nursing while giving talks because I think breastfeeding is a form of food justice um, but this time I left them home and um, it, was a, it was a really great flight out without having to hold and nurse a child for six hours straight so they don't scream and annoy everybody. Um, but it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be back in the Boston area. I lived here from 2000 to 2007. So I, I came here a few hours ago and it, I just remi it reminded me, oh yeah, it's cold here. So I'm like wearing <laughs> shoes as if I'm still in California. But it's good. So, so thank you for welcoming, here, welcoming me here. Um, I usually start off with a song, so I'm going to sing because that's basically how I understand, um, I guess, conveying messages of, of social justice using espresso arts. It's, it's one of the, the reasons that I decided to engage in social justice activism was growing up I heard a lot of 
mainly black women singing songs that had lyrics about social justice issues that I'm now looking at in my dissertation work, like anti-racism and anti-sexism. And one of these groups, Sweet Honey and the Rock, um, which they're very awesome, I don't know, probably, you've probably heard of them. And one of the songs is called um, We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For, which I like to think of as a, a type of mantra that I, I never want to forget that I don't necessarily have to, or we don't necessarily have to wait for someone to come to us as a leader to, to, to bring change, but we're actually the ones that we've been waiting for. So. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones. So I wanted to talk to you guys today about the work I've been doing, my dissertation, which is hopefully, fingers crossed, will be completed at the end of this year. So there's three chapters to the dissertation, and one of them is dealing with Afrocentric notions of veganism. Um, to give you more context of where I'm coming from, first this is a dissertation chapter in progress. So what I did was I took 60 pages of in progress work and tried to condense it into an hour talk. Um, the other parts of the dissertation are looking at PETA and their cruelty-free shopping guide. So I look at that and try to understand how this concept of neoliberalism and whiteness manifest in their guide. And then after the last chapter, Food Empowerment Project, I look at their guide and their relationship to food and what they suggest as a way to understand neoliberalism as a problem. So PETA, I look at it as neoliberalism for PETA doesn't seem to be a problem when they advocate particular products. For FEP, Food Empowerment Project, um, I look at them as a pro-vegan organization that takes issue with particular companies that say something is vegan, cruelty-free, no animals were harmed, but at the same time, the cocoa was sourced from ch child slavery, the sugar was sourced from Haitian slavery, etc. So that's kind of to give you the context of my dissertation work. Um, with my first chapter, which is about Afrocentrism and Queen Afua, this is a way to look at veganism from what I would consider a race consciousness approach. So what does it look like when you enter veganism without this, we're all post-racial mentality, which a lot of mainstream America seems to think we are at because we have a black president. Um, and yes, Queen Afua's work was published in 2000 before Obama won, um, but um, her work is kind of off the grid if you look at mainstream literature that addresses vegan food, vegan politics in America. Um, it's mostly Eurocentric based. A lot of the philosophies, the logics behind why people should become vegan comes from this Eurocentric genealogy canon. And there's nothing wrong with it, but uh, what I've had a problem with over the past five or seven years when researching this is that it seems like that's the only thing that people focus on. And it's, as, 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 it's as if there's no other contributions outside of a Eurocentric canon. Um, and I look at Queen Afua's work because she brings in an Afrocentric pr perspective. So that's kind of to give you the, the background to the project. And now I'm going to go into the official talk. And at the end, I welcome questions and I want to remind people that this is a dissertation chapter in progress. So it's not complete and um, I'm still kind of tackling a lot of difficult concepts. And I thank you for sitting here and, and having me read these ideas to you. So first of all, Queen Afua is one of the most popular and widely read health activists amongst black women in the USA. And um, most black women who want to transition into veganism choose Sacred Woman, this text that was written in the year 2000 by Queen Afua. So for this talk, I'll be analyzing that book. And in this book, she advocates whole food veganism as a way to purify 
decolonize, and liberate black Americans from legacies of colonialism and racism. And she focuses on the womb health to achieve this. So the womb health, the uterus, the ovaries. First, through an Afrocentric framework, I will show how Afua's vegan philosophy combats anti-black conceptualizations of black women as quote-unquote unfeminine and quote-unquote breeders. A construction of black females that began with European colonization and the commodification of African people to fulfill the needs of white colonial and capitalist logic. After this analysis, I use black feminist theorizing to explore how the meanings of fuel places on particular liberating vegan commodities, how these simultaneously reproduces heterosexist, ableist, and black middle class reformist conceptualizations of a healthy black nation. So these are the questions that have been running through my mind as I've been working on this chapter. How do black women vegans think about the relationship to veganism, and how is it affected by the lived experience of being a black racialized, sexualized subject in the USA, circumscribed by a discourse of whiteness and capitalism? Has the racialized colonial and historical placement of her body, particularly the womb and reproductive capacities, affected her vegan methodology? How does the site of the kitchen space serve as an example of black revolutionary feminism? So first of all, Queen of Lua's consciousness represents this thing called revolutionary black female, sorry, revolutionary black feminism. And I'll refer that to as RBF. And second, she uses the pro-vegan philosophy of African holistic health. So first, RBF is a revolutionary black feminist approach. I'm oh, sorry, that was making sense. RBF is an effective framework to explain the lived experience of black women. This perspective understands that the structures, policies, and institutions that dominate the society cannot eradicate oppression that black women endure until it is completely transformed. The core tenets of RBF are, revolutionary vision is dynamic, racial, gender, and sexual oppression are reconfigured within periods of capitalist restructuring, black women's oppression consists of two recursive components, structure and ideology, and there is a dialectical link between theory and practice. An emphasis is placed on describing the current conditions of black women and the interconnecting forces influencing these conditions as a way of contextualizing black women's lived experiences and relevant areas of resistance. What is unique about women engaging in RBF is that there is no correct way of resisting structures of oppression. These black women do know that they need to resist oppression, but they achieve the way they achieve this is not universal and their methods change due to time, location, place, and individual preference. However, the mere fact that they are conscious of being black racialized female subjects in a USA that organizes their lives through racist, sexist, and capitalist oriented structures and policies is what makes their activism revolutionary. In essence, they feel they need to create revolutionary thinking to achieve freedom. For Afua, Realizing how capitalist restructuring within a colonial logic has changed over time, yet simultaneously continues to damage the black female's womb health, <coughs> okay, I'm late, sorry, let me just rephrase that. So, um, Queen Afua, using veganism, um, realizes that that's a way to combat uh, the damages that have occurred on the black female's womb health. So through an Afrocentric and holistic healing program in consciousness, she chooses the method of veganism as her weapon. Now what is African holistic health? And what is Afrocentrism? African holistic health is a methodology that approaches the emotional and physical health of people of African descent. And she refers to them as either African or black. While 
Authors of the dominant canon of vegan philosophies in the global West have drawn from a Eurocentric genealogy, which I spoke of earlier. Those who practice African holistic health philosophies come from an Afrocentric genealogy of health and ethics from southern Kemetic Egypt. Now, Afrocentrists argue that civilization and advancements were not actually from Europe, but in fact from African cultures that influenced European advances in medicine, science, and technologies. In particular, Greece, which is always referred to as the quote-unquote beginning of civilization by Eurocentrists and the Western Academy. The Afrocentrist seeks to uncover and use codes, paradigms, symbols, motives, myths, and circles of discussion that reinforce the centrality of African ideas and values as a valid frame of reference for acquiring and examining data. Now, Queen Afua is part of this canon of African holistic health. And there's three major tenets or common themes that you'll find in the literature. That they are authored by black people of African descent. They promote a plant-centered diet, usually veganism, vegetarianism, or raw foods. And they believe that the holistic plant-centered nutrition should be the root chosen to decolonize the black body from the effects of hundreds of years of anti-black racism, white supremacy, and colonialism. So sacred woman falls into this. I just gave this all this information because I don't want to assume that people already know what I'm talking about. So, Sacred Woman is a comprehensive guide to teach African women how to become queen of one's womb health through a vegan diet, as well as comedic spiritual and exercise practices, ultimately becoming queen of one's health. Now, um, Queen Afua understands that one out of three black women in the USA have fibroid tumors. Um, it's a very, very, very high occurrence, and um, it's basically painful, it causes a lot of infertility problems, and she believes, deeply believes that it's based on eating a non, I guess, uh, not, not a holistic diet, but a acidifying diet that she thinks is rooted into industrialized food practices, junk food, um, acidifying, so foods that are acid forming that break down the body. And she believes in her book that um, the state of your womb reflects the state of your life. So for her, what is central to woman is the womb. That's what makes a woman a woman. For people who are, um, who've been trained in, in feminist theory, that you'll learn that you know, woman is a construction, it's a social construction. That's how at least she feels that women, their center is their womb. That's what makes women women. And an unhealthy womb is a problem for to achieve, um, I guess, what she she believes is a is healthier, healthy womanhood. So always emphasizing comedic roots, what a fool wants sacred woman to achieve is to teach black women that holistic eating and veganism does not have a white Eurocentric genealogy. Instead, her preface creates an imagined community that existed during pre-colonial era in which black Africans were in control of their spiritual, physical, and mental health. And um, this is a key component to her work because a lot of the mainstream media today that focuses on health and food, it paints a picture that African or black people are hopeless and helpless, and that they can't help themselves, and um, they're kind of the white man's burden. And it's only the white middle class weight of food um, and nutrition that will quote unquote save them. And for Afua to have published Sacred Woman and kind of turn it, the, the, the agency onto black women as the ones that can actually eat, quote unquote, the right way to help cure their bodies from racialized health disparities is actually revolutionary. And um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with alternative food movements in America, but there tends to be a trend where black communities and brown communities are saved by largely white middle class um, activists who are interested in food. Um, and um, there's, not, there's not a problem with activism, but the problem comes when one doesn't understand how their own racial and class and gender locations may negatively impact communities that don't come from those particular ontologies or epistemologies. So um, I think that's what is key about Afua's work, is kind of looking at, look at black people are not helpless, we're not hopeless, we can do it on our own. And not only can we do it on our own, um, it came, 
you know, what you're doing now, Whole Foods Movement, it came from Africa, it came from us. So it's, it's an interesting spin um, to a narrative in America in which black has been, the, the, the concept of blackness or black has been demonized, criminalized, um, pathologized, if that makes sense. So she's kind of letting people know Egypt, it's where it's all at. And you know, Egypt is not the representations of white Egypt that you saw that um, Elizabeth Taylor portrayed and Cleopatra. And they're actually black, black people ruled Egypt and we have the intellectual capacity to heal ourselves before colonialism. So it's important to understand that what she's doing, it's not superficial. She's trying to get the collective black female community to understand that your history did not begin with slavery. And your history did not begin as, begin as somebody without agency. So does that make sense? Okay. So um, I'm going to. Oh, I just lost my place. Sorry about that. One second. Um, try to go to the next part. Of, sorry, I'm trying to use the Kindle for the first time as a way to read the presentation. So I want to get jump back into Sacred Woman. Um, so. In the text, she's just you know constantly reminding people that it comes from Egypt. Black, Egypt was black. Um, and what I find interesting about the dissertation that I work I'm doing is that I'm looking at commodities. I'm looking at commodity culture. So I'm looking at the foods that represent vegan commodity culture. Pita, FEP, and Queen of Food. They suggest particular foods that you're supposed to eat um, as ways to create a more socially just society. At the same time, I think what makes a FUWA's work unique is that she's trying to figure out how can black women eat in a way that's healthy to combat when they used to be commodities. So the, you know, the history that PETA brings to people when they suggest particular food commodities, it doesn't come from, oh, we collectively used to be commodities in terms of slavery. And um, this is probably goes for most of white middle class um, vegan movement. Like there, there's a starting point of veganism where collectively this demographic doesn't think of themselves as, oh, we used to be commodities and now we have to decolonize our body. So with Afua, she's thinking about, well, the womb was a commodity about four or five hundred years ago, a black female womb, and it entered this um, colonial capitalist logic. And there were incredibly negative, devastating consequences that we see today. So what I wanted to do was kind of understand, you know, what does Afua mean when she wants to go back into southern Kemetic Egypt to reclaim the womb and reclaim it through a Kemetic raw foods vegan diet. So I did some research to really understand this concept of, okay, what was Southern Egypt supposedly like? What type of society was it like? And why is Afuwa focused on that versus Eurocentric ways of understanding health and healing? So I came across um, a scholar named Diop, and he is known for, I guess he's like the, the center of, of Afrocentric scholarship. He kind of defined it. So um, he wrote, quote, that, Southern Egyptian matriarchal system was marked by the sacredness of the mother and her unlimited authority. There were oaths invoking the power of the mother, that is, the ritualization of what matricentric mother and child, closest bond of love, quoted even in Eumenides. This is the spirit of common motherhood, generally symbolized in African religions. So Daya believed that women basically were seen as sacred. And he felt that that particular space, I'm a geographer, that space, that location, was a, a sacred, a healing space for women and how they were looked at, particularly black women. Um, he looks at the northern globe, um, Europe, um, as being exemplified by a culture that is patriarchal, um, capitalist, or will become capitalist, um, and kind of was characterized by war and violence and crime. So for him and Afua, their logic is, how is it that we can begin to heal our bodies if we're only looking at the spaces of the North, Eurocentric ideologies, Europe? These spaces contributed to the situation that we're in now. People from these spaces engaged in colonialism, they abducted us, they brought us to the Americas. So he and 
her, she, her, his logic and her logic is that <coughs> we're going to find those remedies in the past and in this global southern space where it makes the most sense because when we're treated as queens that we're going to draw from those raw food ideologies to, um, to create this new future black community. So um, what the legacies of the Global North did to the black womb was that um, it created the womb as a unit of production. So by that I mean black women were forced to um, breed slaves. Um, they were raped by white slave masters. So there's just history of violence toward the room. And in addition to that, um, black women were forced to breastfeed the white slave master's babies, many of them before they could breastfeed their own. So, so I'm looking at this black woman, they were this commodity in capitalist culture to, to basically build America. So they literally fed with their bodies in America, and they literally were laboring, they were actually part of the food system by harvesting much of the food that built America. And um, what I find really interesting about Sacred Woman and Afua's work is that she makes that really clear in one of her passages. And it's one of the reasons I actually became a vegan and how veganism connected with me as a black woman who um, didn't really have words to describe what I was feeling in terms of racism and sexism in this country. I knew there was something there and I, I had a lot of hurt. I was diagnosed with fibroid tumors when I was 23. Um, I didn't realize I was eating in a way that um, wasn't conducive to healing during stressful times. It was like, contributing to fibroid tumors growing badly. And I just couldn't, I couldn't make the connections. Um, and then I was given Sacred Woman and I read this text and um, it just, it really shifted my understanding of veganism as a way to potentially combat um, the legacies of racism and sexism and all those uh, consequences on the collective black female body. So I'll read it. I cry a river of tears that heal for the Negro slave woman, my great-great-grandmother, who was forced to part her thighs for the entrance of a pale pink penis to fulfill her owner's dem demonic quest to force his way violently into her soft, dark womb. Leaving his, pardon me, I can't breathe. I'm still enraged 200 years later. I still hurt. I still bleed. I'm outraged, feeling fear and helplessness for all my great-great-grandmothers who passed their self-hate lack of self-esteem, their acceptance of abuse, their internal war down through the bloodlines to me. I am the African woman crying out my pain, screaming and retching rivers of tears from generation to generation. My tears boil up from the bile of plantation slave life here in America the beautiful. Here where institutionalized sex factories were brutally imposed upon a stolen people for generations. I cry for the soft wounds and damaged souls of my mothers, who were forced to bear babies of rage and incest. They were wound casualties in a 400-year war that damaged them down to the DNA. The wounds go oh so deep within the wounds of the women folk of my tribe. I am praying to wounds that carried on even after self-inflicted and societal wound violations. Wounds that carried on with only one ovary left to fend for itself due to inner toxicity. Um, so I thought there was just a lot going on in that quote. and. Um, Though she does not talk about animal rights, I also saw a lot of um, you know, these institutionalized sex factories and just thinking about at the same time reading about um, the forced breeding and, and rape racks that, that a lot of non-human animals have to go through. So um, reading this and then reading other texts about non-human animals, I saw a lot of scary connections. Um, and Afua doesn't bring in animal rights into her literature at all, um, but I do talk about that in my work. Um, the, the lack of focusing on animal rights in Sacred Woman is not necessarily that Afua is a species, um, but she's focused kind of first, her concept of cruelty free um, is creating access to food, healthy food for a black population who was denied it because of the cruelty of slavery. So she's kind of coming from a perspective of cruelty free from a quote unquote human rights point of view, um, a human rights I guess access to food that I'd have to argue that a lot of um, those who are, I guess, beneficiaries of the white racial status quo don't necessarily have to deal with. So, um, white middle class racial status quo. Uh, so, 
I've had conversations with people over the past few years who don't necessarily understand or are offended when they read um, some of her work and they are animal rights activists and they, they come to the conclusion that she just must not care about animals. And I think it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, a lot of people of color in this country um, were still fighting for the rights of humanity, which I know if you're post-humanist, that's a problem. But um, the mere fact that so many of us were first constructed and are still seen as animals and don't have the right to be humans yet, and then how that's impacted our health, our nutritional um, education, our access to particular foods, that's a, a lot of that is priority first. Um, and Queen Afua, yes, she does not talk about animal rights, but there are plenty of women who've been inspired by sacred women who go on to make those connections. And a lot of them, I see a lot of them using uh, Queen Afua's work um, in tandem with Carol J. Adams' work. So, um, you know, just because I, I gave this talk last year at Berkeley, and I, I did irritate quite a few people who were only here to talk about animal rights. Um, and I also let people know that it's hard to actually build a social justice movement if you're inflexible and you don't see that it's all connected. Um, so if it upsets you that sacred woman, you know, looks at black people and how to combat the legacies of colonialism on their body and she's not looking at animal rights, then it might actually be a good idea for you to kind of step out of your comfort zone and look at why it's important to this community and why they're suffering from it. So these connections, um, they're real, and um, it's been interesting the last year. It's kind of getting feedback from people who were upset about that. Uh, and the other part of her work that is upsetting to a lot of people who may be second wave feminists, which is basically um, fem feminism from the white, middle class, straight female point of view. Um, the, the concept of a woman going back to a kitchen to create a future nation, uh, a lot of people found that uh, problematic but um, unfeminist. Um, so I'm going to talk about those issues in the next um, section. Actually, I'll just sorry about this. I actually don't really I don't really feel like too much reading too much from the, the paper. I'm going to kind of start improving. But um, there's a problem that people have when um, people think that a woman going back into a kitchen must must be that she's in a submissive place. You know, how can the kitchen be feminine? So. It depends how you construct the kitchen and what your relationship to the kitchen is. So with Afua, she's trying to explain that the kitchen is a feminine place, it is a sacred place. Now if you understand the history of black women in this country and what the place of the kitchen meant during slavery and even after, um, a kitchen was a place where quote unquote mammy spent, a mammy was providing the meals, making the food for white America. And a mammy by definition is unfeminine and not sacred. So what Queen Afua is doing essentially is reconfiguring the meaning of the kitchen in a positive way for a collectivity of black females who have been told that you know the kitchen is the space where the mammy belongs, where they, it's unfeminine and all, all of this stuff. So she's taking the kitchen and she's saying, you know what, black women, you are feminine, you are queens. And even better, you have the power it takes to actually create a healthy black nation. And to actually call, you know, she calls herself Queen Afua, to actually tell a black woman that she's a queen is also re what used to be taught collectively to America, which is black women are, are not, they're, dis they're disposable, they're not queens, they're not worthy of being put on the pedestal. So with, if you understand that logic within that collective history, then it begins to make sense why she would propose why women have, black women have agency in the kitchen to start eating and eating for themselves and providing for their family um, food that will then continue to build a healthier black nation. Um, and yes, there are, I also see problems with that as well um, because a lot of the rhetoric that Queen Afua has um, is focused on, yes, Black women, we have to be agents because the government just failed us. So we have to take it upon ourselves to build the family and feed our man the right way and uh, make sure our children eat the right way. But at the same time, um, I think there's a problem overall with the book. There's assumptions made that women are partnered with men. Women are partnered with men that are black. Um, and that men are not responsible um, for their actions. 
and that is women who have to feed their men the right way to produce um, a more civilized black man. Um, so while reading um, Queen Afua's work, she'll say to you, you know, is your man acting um, foolish? Is your man acting sexually aggressive? You know, it's not his fault. Check his diet. What have you been feeding him? What has he been eating? So she makes this connection um, that a lack of purity of diet creates a sexually aggressive man. And I, had, I have mixed feelings about this. Um, she feels that if a woman feeds her man raw foods, you know, alkalizing diet, then that will adjust that behavior and then he'll become um, the way he should be, the king that he should be. And um, at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, that's not fair because basically you're essentially, you're, you're suggesting um, you know, if a man becomes, if a man is a rapist, uh, that it is the, it's the responsibility of um, the black woman he's partnered with to be feeding him the right way. Um, and then at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, well, we do live in a culture where, um, in America, black men have been constructed by the media as rapists, as um, criminals, and her response to that is, well, obviously the government is not going to help us, the media is not going to help us, so maybe I can help us through asking black women to take control of their kitchen and feed their family in a way that um, makes them more, more in sexual harmony. So, you know, there's these interesting um, conflicts that I see with her argument and her reasons why black women should be eating raw foods, vegan diet. I can kind of see her struggling with, with um, you know, this is what it should be. Um, and then she kind of being read as, well, you're an anti-feminist. Um, and one of the other things that I thought was interesting is this concept of purity. And not in just her rhetoric, but in um, most of the African holistic health, there's this fear that if you don't eat pure, uh, that there will be um, homosexuality, uh, there will be gender confusion. So there's this concept that if you eat the right diet, um, you can basically cure yourself of um, the quote-unquote element of being quote-unquote, gender-confused or homosexual. And um, that's like hugely problematic. Now, Queen Afua never actually says anything overtly homophobic or transphobic. But she's part of this whole canon that, for the most part, they do say these, these particular things. And she has worked with um, a man named Dr. Lala Africa, who is like completely convinced that um, if you find homosexuality in the black community or gender-confused, uh, black people, it's because they've been eating the diet of the oppressor. They've been eating the white man's diet. So um, I find that really, really like just horribly problematic. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to what degree can we decolonize our bodies or think we can when, you know, she's taking this concept of Southern Kemetic vegan Egypt. I mean, this is, you know, over a thousand years ago, um, this happened during a time where it wasn't colonialism, wasn't capitalism. To how much can we actually decolonize our brains without it having been affected by colonialism? So, you know, homophobia and transphobia, to me, that's still um, a legacy of European colonialism. So, when a lot of this rhetoric, you know, comes into the black community as a way to save us, you know, I, I start thinking about Franz Fanon and, and Hugh he Warning, you know, that can we possibly decolonize ourselves 100% without having been heavily influenced by colonialism? I mean, is that really, can you ever 100% be conscious of, of those, those negative effects on your consciousness? So as I read a lot of what she has to offer, um, you know, I mean, she, I have to admit, you know, when I ate the diet that she um, prescribed, I carried my, I carried my fried rate tumors. I was really grateful for that. Um, so the, the diet for most women of African descent who were following it, they all had, you know, great results. Um, but at the, the same time, the logic behind why we should do it, you know, it's alienating for those of us who are queer, um, those of us who are not partnered with a, a black person. Um, and I started thinking about, you know, how her conception of this future black nation, even though she isn't, like I said, overtly saying, you know, gay people are, 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 are you know, the result of the white man's diet. Um, what she proposes, that I see a future of black women who are supposed to be straight and see, see IS gender privilege partnered with black men of the same. Um, and it's, 
I guess what I'm saying is, this is why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. I do experience a lot of um, aggression from um, people in the African holistic health community when I propose that, you know, there's, this is a problem. Um, and it, it actually, it's a form of violence and it's causing violence. So you're talking about, you know, a diet that's supposed to liberate, but at whose expense? So these are the things that I'm thinking about. Um, and also there's a lot of the, the ableist rhetoric, which is not just in Afua's work, but most of the vegan community, where there's this like, you know, to be healthy, you know, how is healthy constructed? Um, there's this, you know, this, this, this fear of, of we're not going to be a quote unquote pure society unless we eat a certain way that makes our bodies quote unquote healthy. But if you look at the history of how health is defined in the USA, it's like the benchmark for healthy is usually the white, middle class, thin, able-bodied, straight person. So I think again about how much of Queen Afua's rhetoric is influenced by that, the notion of, of, of what is healthy and, and how it's influenced by kind of living in a society in which structural ableism is the norm. Um, but I, I think overall she is still revolutionary because if you look at the people who have benefited from the work that she's done, um, not everyone, I've talked to a lot of women, not all of us agree, like, like, like sacred women is not viable and we just hold on to it without being critical. But it's, it's helped us really open up to really understand that Eurocentric views are not the only way, and Afrocentric views aren't the only way either. Um, but it's, all, it's kind of an experiment for us to start seeing how we can push forward on, uh, be, be less rigid around con concepts of the body, concepts of food, um, that we previously just thought, you know, oh, well, eating animals, that's, that's normal, or thinking the Eurocentric way of doing things is the most civilized, you know, so we're just kind of using these, um, you know, sacred women kind of as a jumping off point. Um, and for me, I find it um, really helpful that this text is available, uh, but I'm going to jump into the socioeconomic class implications of the text, which is, um, she proposes, just go on. She proposes a lot of food and culinary equipment that literally you, you have to be lower middle to middle class to access. Um, so if you look at this picture, which is from her book, um, she's on the left. That's um, Queen <laughs> Afua. Um, so we look, 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 look here. The Vitamix, right? That's like a $600 blender. Okay, and I saved up for two years to get it as a gift to myself. I passed my qualifying, so I, I got it. But I was like, what does it do? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's cool. That's why if you've ever seen my videos, you know, how I make my kale smoothies. Because if you use a regular blender, you're just like chewing the leaves. But the, the Vitamix, it's, it's, you know, it's soft. Um, so if you, look, yeah, I'm, I'm going to eat. Uh, so if you, if you look at this picture, there's just a lot going on. Um, so if you look in the back, she is against the corporate capitalist kitchen. So you don't see any foods that are, you know, prepackaged items. Um, it's all bulk items. And she usually tells people that you should eat organic if you want to have a, a womb that is healthy. Um, but I also see in front is a basket of citrus fruit. So this picture, I guess, probably takes place in New York because that's where she's based, based out of. And um, I'm talking about the commodity chain a lot in my work. And um, throughout the whole book, it's cool that she focuses on you should be you know, eating raw, you should be eating organic if you have access to it. But She's coming from what I would consider a black middle class sensibility. And she, probably because of her socioeconomic status, can access organic foods, can access these bulk items. If you look at the statistics on food access by race and class in this country, um, black and brown communities really struggle with getting access to raw produce, the type of things that she suggests to build a healthy black community. Um, and she doesn't really mention the, the socioeconomic class access piece in her book. She's really into the race conscious approach. But after analyzing the book, I realized it's kind of a race conscious approach from a black middle class perspective. And she's part of this overarching history of black middle class reformers, where they go and they try to educate um, lower black middle class women how to just produce a politics of respectability so they can be more accepted into a white society. And no, she doesn't say this in her book, but that's the feeling I get where she's saying, you know, our kitchen is not going to be the modern kitchen. You know, get, get rid of those microwaves and those canned food, like all of these markers of class. And a lot of people, um, a lot of you know, women
women um, who may have to be the, the, the um, providers for the family in terms of making food and, and going to work, a lot of them use microwaves because it saves time. Now, a fool is proposing food regimens like dehydrating, making your own stuff. I mean, this takes time and it takes money. And um, a lot of the women that read this book, uh, the Sister Vegan Project, where we talk, a lot of them are like, you know, I like the theory behind it, but I, I don't have time. I'm a single mom. I have like two jobs. You know, how can I do this? So I find it rather odd that she doesn't mention that class aspect to our work. Um, and another piece that is really important, I think, which a lot of people tend to overlook, is just understanding the food commodity chain. So she's proposing to eat food from Southern Kemetic Egypt from a thousand years ago, but you know, the food system isn't the way it was back then that it is now. So she's totally aware that black people were enslaved and to be part of this commodity chain for 400 or 500 years to build America. And then she's like, okay, we're going to decolonize our bodies from this, right? So these are the foods you're going to eat. But she never actually thinks about, well, okay, black child slavery is illegal now. It's done. So let's heal ourselves with these food. But, okay, so now if you understand the global food economy, global food chain, slavery hasn't ended. It's just either taken on a different method or way, or it's just been moved to where most first world consumer citizens can't, can't um, I'm not going to say see this at ableist, but can, are, are unaware of, okay? Um, so if you look at the fact that she is promoting like citrus, she's into citrus um, cleanses, uh, and that's, that's produce. A lot of the produce in this country is harvested via exploited, usually brown, Latino laborers. And um, the way they came to that position is through structural racism, poverty, sexism, um, most notably NAFTA, that kind of makes it possible for a lot of us first world consumer privileged vegans to have access to these pure foods, these vegan cruelty free foods. So I found it interesting that she doesn't say anything in the book that you know, ladies make sure that the foods that you buy um, as much as possible aren't part of this chain of suffering that we used to be part of. And um, once again, I think that's just kind of, it, it marks how hard it is to, to decolonize one's mind, even though they're very conscious that we want to decolonize, how hard it is when you've been born and raised in a capitalist, consumer, neoliberal economy. Does that make sense? So she's trying really hard to do this decolonization thing, but I also see how she's not exempt from being influenced by, by um, I guess, particular ideologies in society where, you know, um, right now it's so popular that your food should be organic and pure. Like, there's all these, these, all these ethical schemes labeled on these foods that talk about the quality of the food, but we don't actually get to see about the quality of the life of the laborers. Does that make sense? So a lot of the food that she proposes, she's like, make sure it's organic, make sure it's non-GMO, but she doesn't say make sure it's not from enslaved people, like communities that have been enslaved the way that we have been. Um, so this is, this is the first, this is the second chapter of my book, the first is the intro, but then the next two chapters after that, that's when I really start digging into the commodity chain and really looking at um, these concepts of what happens when you're an organization like PETA, where it's basically run by white neoliberalist framing of justice, and you're like, it's okay, you know, guess what? Hershey's cocoa is vegan. It's cruelty free. I'm like, uh, like about tens of thousands of you know little black West African children are actually harvesting that as slaves. How is that cruelty free? And you know, places like PETA never talk about that. Afua does not advocate cocoa or sugar, so that's interesting because she believes that it's toxic and it produces um, an impure system. She doesn't really focus too much on the fact that it's enslaved laborers that still harvest it. But places like PETA, um, if you, um, I analyze their vegan cruelty free shopping guide, it's like, as long as an animal wasn't harmed, it's okay. But a lot, like, a lot of their ingredients are harvested by, by actually enslaved laborers. Um, so I find that just interesting. And like my focus on my work is just looking at how first world geopolitical privilege shape our relationship to uh, being in the food commodity cha chain as consumers um, or producers. And uh, for the most part, most I think every vegan I've ever met has been a, a, citizen, a citizen consumer in the vegan commodity chain. They haven't been like the harvester or the enslaved cocoa plantation 
worker who escaped to talk about that cocoa is actually not like this luxurious, pleasurable commodity, but it's actually suffering. So I look at that at um, Food and Poverty Project, um, and they're looking at um, making vegans more aware that cocoa is actually problematic, and then they're also taking um, Cliff Bar to task because uh, they don't use fair trade chocolate. Um, they're claiming to be part of Rainbow Alliance, Rainforest Alliance, but they're hoping that most consumer citizens in America who are trying to be eco-conscious aren't very literate with all the ethical labeling schemes. And FEP takes issue with them using Rainforest because Rainforest says you only have to have 30% of your ingredients not from slavery. So it's just something to think about, like what happens when overall um, we start entering um, the green movement in a way that's been dictated now by corporate capitalists who are interested in making a profit off of it. So that's kind of what my whole overarching dissertation work is about. But I thank you guys for kind of listening and um, hearing me out to do this because it's, I mean, it's hard. And um, I, I guess I come here just encouraging people if you're doing, like I, I'm, con I'm considered doing fringe work. Um, I get a lot of people who, I, I don't want people to agree with everything I say, but I am looking at topics that make people uncomfortable, that upset people. So um, talking about whiteness and veganism to the mainstream vegan movement, it's, I've gotten hate mail. I get my hate mail. It's, you know, I get people saying, you shouldn't be doing race and whiteness, it's only about the animals. And I get hate mail. I got a, a, a nice hateful review when Sister Vegan first came out because this black woman was like, she's not a real black person, she's bisexual. Oh my god, she's married to a white man. Her son is even white. I mean, son's, son's even black, like all of these issues. I'm like, okay, I must be doing something right. So, <laughs> but it's just like, yeah, so I'm just encouraging for people, a lot of people who are kind of doing um, fringe work and are finding, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably a lot of students here who are doing a lot of this type of work. Like, it's hard, and sometimes it might feel like, oh my god, maybe I am doing something wrong. But um, I think. I think you have to kind of push the boundaries and you have to really, everyone, if you're really dedicated to making a socially just world, like we have to branch out, we have to kind of move past our comfort zones, um, and we have to encourage others to understand that concept of solidarity and, and intersectionality. And, you know, I talk to people all the time that I'm, I'm a recipient, I've been a recipient of racism and and sexism, but you know, I'm, I'm also, I have multiple layers of privilege that I still have to acknowledge. Like, I'm a first world consumer citizen. And I still consume in a way that is hurtful. I know that. And I'm still trying to decolonize my brain. And I know it's never going to be 100%, but like, you know, we shouldn't always just be focused on, oh, I'm a recipient of racism, and then lose out on the fact that you know, I, I use a Kindle and an Apple computer, which a lot of the, the, um, the minerals used, um, minerals to build these computers are sourced from slavery or sweatshop you know, uh, conditions. So it's just, I'm just offering that. It's, it's kind of hard, it's kind of challenging, and it's frustrating, but um, I, I just, I just, I guess, I'm just saying that not to give up. And um, you're probably on the right path if you're, if you're experiencing a lot of a frustrating shit of trying to find community and trying to figure out, figure out where exactly you're going with trying to merge it all together. So thank you, and I'm not sure if I'm out of time yet. Oh, perfect. So it's been an hour. So um, I welcome questions and comments, and I just remind people that like it's a dissertation work in progress. And I'm very thankful that you guys just kind of sat here and listened to me talk about these ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
So what is healthy? <coughs> well, the thing is, I don't actually have uh, an appropriate answer for that. I do know the more and more I do this work, the more I'm actually surprising myself on how my own, what I thought was healthy was actually kind of based on, um, on I guess, prejudiced views about other people's bodies. So I, I, I can't answer that. I know that it's a social construction. I know it, it, it changes with time and place. Um, it changes with economic and political interests. Um, if you think about, you know, even the foods that people said were healthy back in the day and how they're seen as unhealthy now. Like for instance, avocados, everyone's like, it's too hard for it. You can't eat avocados every day. Now, like, that's all you see in California is like, eat an avocado a day. Is it really healthy or is it because, like, the avocado industry is making money off of it? Uh, I think one of the biggest um, controversies is obesity and the construction of obesity. And um, I think I, I want to point you to Julie Guthman's work. She actually has a new book uh, that looks at um, obesity. I can't remember what it's called. Weighing in. It's called. Um, it's like obesity and the limits of capitalism. So you know, really understanding. Or actually, a lot of the new work on food and health that's coming out is really trying to understand it within the context of neoliberal capitalism. So what does it actually mean to say that there's an obesity epidemic? You know, what what is it? What does it mean that a lot of the um, like what is a healthy BMI? What does it mean that's actually based on um, people of your angle descent and not body type. You know, what does it mean if you have a particular ancestry where the people look completely different because of the way they adapted to their bodies and maybe they have more dense bones or dense muscle. It's just all the really di different things that I never really thought about until I started engaging into, uh, engaging in, um, I guess, the discipline of understanding the, the social constructions of health of the body. So I'm sorry, it's like it's not an actual like direct answer, but I mean, it's a social construction. Um, and I, I, I really can't, I can't give you a concrete answer. That's fine. Yeah. But what, what about um, the scientific constructions of what is healthy and what um, just promotes longevity of life? See, I'm not, I actually am not, um, I don't do clinical nutrition too much, but I also um, let people know that even science is based, it's, it's actually um, not 100% objective, so. Um, I, I don't know, when I read some of the, the few things I've read of nutritional science, I just, I'm not literate enough to really know who funded them, like, it's just so hard, like, okay, so what company funded you, what's your interest, it's really difficult for me to answer for you, so you'd have to probably ask someone who's maybe a holistic nutrition to get a better understanding, but I always thought that there isn't, like, the, 